Greetings, P. Opals, and welcome back to my channel and my little corner of crazy town. Today we're going to go in with the Double D99 again. This is video number two on this deck. Just got done servicing the transport on Friday, I think. Took me a whole day to edit the video on Saturday, and I'm starting this video on Sunday, which is October the 6th, so... That way you can kind of tell just how long it's taking me to get this particular deck done. But, uh, this video is going to be just like the last one. I'm allowed to take as much time as I feel I need for servicing this part of it. Which is basically checking to see if the uh, transport still needs anything, or if uh, there are any issues with the electronics, and do the recap and all that other stuff. But, uh, first thing we're going to do is, uh, calibrate, but even before that we're going to have to get in here and see if the transport is actually working properly. I actually have a high degree of confidence that it is actually fully serviced and fully working, so uh, we will find out shortly. But first I wanted to uh, let you know what my plan is regarding the felt clutches in these uh, real hub assemblies of these JVCs. I have decided that this will not be my experimentation deck with that. Reason being, every time you take these uh, little caps off inside these uh, things that lock down the reel tables, they get a little bit looser. And uh, on the take-up side of this deck, it's now so loose that I'm very afraid that I'm going to have to replace the cap. And I've only got two replacements in the auto-reverse transport, and one of those is already kind of working its way loose. So, yeah... Officially, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to try the felt replacement on the Double D7 first. So we're going to skip over the TDV 931 entirely with that experiment. Too expensive, what can I say? But, uh, yeah, we'll try it first with the Double D7, because that's the one that's going to need the most help. I guarantee you that. It drives the counter belt off those uh, reel tables, so... Uh, absolutely has to be working properly in that machine, so makes sense to just wait for that. And also you have to realize that when it comes to my top machines like this, like the TDV 931 and Double D 99, these don't play tapes. These are here for recording only. And I would like this one to play tapes too, but it's not critical. But uh, yeah, the low... Uh, take-up torque on this machine and the TDV 931 you'd think would be an issue, but it's only really an issue with uh, me getting rid of the frickin' Avast pop-up that came up on my laptop. I gotta get rid of that crappy software. Anyway, where was I? Ah yes, tapes. Low take-up torque like this machine and the TDV 931 have is really only an issue when uh, you get tapes that have uh, a real hard time re-spooling the tape after they've gone through the pinch roller and capstan. Because it's the pinch roller and capstan that do most of the driving of the tape. And uh, yeah, this is the kind of si situation that, uh, that you'd want to avoid with this deck right now, is playing tapes like this, these cheap plastic welded tapes from the 80s and 90s that... Uh, that get these sticky tape syndrome going on and they have trouble with the uh, real friction and yeah these types of tapes do not go into the TDB 931 or this deck they will not be happy with it all these machines have to do is uh, take a brand new high quality blank tape and spool it and both this deck and the TDB 931 have no problems with that the 931 has 20 grams per centimeter of take-up torque. It's very low, don't get me wrong, but it's not game-breaking low. I can live with it. And that's why I'm waiting for the Double D7 to uh, address this uh, felt clutch situation. Oh yeah, and one other thing, those felt clutches just shipped today on the 6th, so they're going to take a while to be here. Okay, with all that being said... We need to fire this up and see just how well this transport service went. So we'll keep our distractions away with the laptop there. Power it up. 
power on the test bench set up here because it's easier than the home theater. Now, I don't know if you can see it, but we've got counter. We've got all the lights on we want to see. We're going to try playing my demo tape first. Quartz lock is lit up, so the motor's running. Okay, we'll get in real close and we'll see how well the reels are turning and all that stuff. And uh, what the transport does. Seems like it's doing all right, but uh, we're gonna try Music Scan because that's the one that gives you the most trouble when you've got that little lazy arm in there on the uh, head block that I showed you I was fixing. See if this works. Yes, it does. I'm hearing a little bit of distortion in the audio, but that could be all those old capacitors. So next step, I think, is going to be to check the wow and flutter and uh, see how well the transport is working in that regard. So I'll get you in on my laptop here. Windows is screwing around with me, trying to get me to... Uh, deal with stuff I don't want to deal with right now, but uh, yeah, I'm going to use this test tape first, the Denon DRM3 tape. I'm using this one because it's uh, the best tape I have for speed stability in a depth that is not quartz lock. But yeah, the uh, Denon DRM3 runs at 2,999 hertz and uh, only has about a 1% speed drift. That's why I'm using it for this one. And it doesn't hurt that it's got 0. Point something like 3-5% wow and flutter or something like that. Should give us a good idea as to what this deck is looking like. It's not my lowest for wow and flutter, but it's second lowest. I think the TDD 931 might have taken that crown by now. All right, let's see what we got. This will tell us for sure if the transport is performing roughly the way it should be. Three thousand twenty-two point three hertz, zero point zero three five percent. That's exactly what I was expecting. It's running well. This could be really good if I leave it like this for making 3 kilohertz tapes, but uh, you see it's drifting up and down a little bit. We're up to about 0.051% there. This is because the, the transport of the JVC here and the transport of the Denon have different resonant frequencies in different parts, so they're interacting with each other. That's what's going on there. So. I'll shut this tape off now, and I'm going to go with the uh, the other three kilohertz tape, the one on the or the one from the RSB755. That one gave me 0.029% with this deck before service, and I'll warn you now, it's probably not going to be much different because the Technics runs at about 0.02. 2-9% or something like that. This deck should be outperforming that deck for Wow and Flutter, but we won't know that until I uh, go in with video number three and do a 3 kilohertz tape on this machine and then start comparing it with my other machines. And we won't really know for sure until the double D7 is fixed because it's the other one with this transport. Okay, let's see where this tape gets us. Oh yeah, it's happy with this one, and I'm happy with this one. 
already saw 0 0.0302. It's going to resonate up and down like the other tape did. Give me the 0.029% you gave me before. I know you can do it. Ah, that's okay. It doesn't have to do it. These tapes are not intended actually for wow and flutter testing. They're intended for speed calibration. You need specialized hardware and specialized equipment in order to do tapes like that. And I will just never have access to those. Okay, so wow and flutter looks good. All this other stuff looks good. So transport's working well. So now we gotta align the azimuth. Okay, folks, just getting set up to do the azimuth now. I'm gonna throw my Hans Peter Roth tape in. I'm gonna find my flashlight because I'll need to, to see the adjustment. And we're just gonna see where this comes out. I might have to adjust the scope here, but uh, that's easy enough. Oh, maybe not too much. That looks pretty good. Anyhow, we will try to adjust on this now and get things dialed in. I can find the screw. Holy crap, it was already right there. Unbelievable. Let me auto this. Yeah, it's looking good. Of course, now that I've autoed it, it's going to pull the uh, waveforms back where I don't want them. Levels are kind of low, but those adjustments we will do later, I think. But yeah, I can go Lisa Giroux thing with this too, if I really want to. Don't know that I need to, really. XY, there we go. It's not quite so good. The, uh, the opening and closing thing that's happening there, that'll be that felt clutch, I'm sure of it, almost. But you know what? I'm just going to leave it right there because that is how the A and D machine is aligned and it's how I align every other machine. I use this side of the tape, the one with the label on it. And as you can see, this tape has been rehomed into a different shell because I like this shell better. It seems like it's better quality. I might rehome it again because I don't like the variation between sides, but uh, azimuth is now dialed in, so... Uh, what we gotta do now is paint lock the adjustment screw, or what I gotta do is paint lock it. So give me a few minutes to do that, and we'll come back and we'll try the auto calibration and see if that completes. Well, there it is. How do you like my new color for locking down these azimuth screws? I picked up another flavor of nail polish while well, I was in the city last week, and uh, I decided to go for bright pink because uh, I need two different colors for the uh, TDV 931 and I figured bright pink was nice for uh, for just telling where the azimuth screw is at and uh, whether or not it's moved. The other one I've got is green, also a bright color. So yeah, I decided to use the, the pink with this one. So uh, we'll power this back on again and the home theater is running now. Because it's a little better quality than the uh, than the test bench speakers, and what I'm going to do. Well, let's see. Should I do the uh, auto cal test first? Yeah, maybe I should. So I'm going to grab this here. UR90. This is the exact tape it auto calibrated to before. We're just going to go in on the. Uh, this section here, and we'll just see if it completes. 
whether it does or doesn't, it's just to gather data right now. I hope it does because I want to take this and uh, put it on the shelf for a couple of weeks and probably play a couple of tapes through it and uh, just make sure the transport's working before I start getting into the full recap. So let's see what happens here. Again, it completed this before. Bias, EQ, sensitivity, EQ. And it looks like it did it. No arrow lights at all. So I'm gonna go back to preset, clear that out. And yeah. If there's anything else wrong with this machine, it's probably going to be minor because it clearly recorded something. It does record. It wouldn't have completed the uh, AutoCal if it didn't record. So uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take this here Vaporwave tape made with the GXE9100, which is aligned in azimuth perfectly with this now. And I should get all my treble and all my bass and it should sound amazing. But uh, because of the uh, first track on here, I'm only going to have to, or I'm only going to be able to play like maybe six seconds at a time of this track because it'll trigger content ID if I don't do that. So uh, let's see what this sounds like. I want to see if all of my treble is there in both channels. And uh, the emit tweeters in the home theater are going to tell me that for dang sure. Those emit tweeters are amazing. So let's see what happens. Well, folks, I think we're there, at least with the uh, calibration on this unit. I think the azimuth is perfect. I'm not completely sold on it yet, but uh, again, we have a lot of really bad capacitors in there that have to be changed, and that is my next little endeavor. I'm leaving the azimuth right where it is, and I'm gonna get the power supply recap done, and I think what I'm gonna do is, like I said, I'm gonna probably put it on a shelf for a couple of weeks, listen to it off and on, maybe do a, a, a complete vaporwave recording with it, and yeah, I just need to figure out just how well everything else is working before we continue this video. So yeah, power supply recap immediately because I have to make sure that this thing doesn't blow up in my face when the, when I work on it again. And yeah. All right, so it's been a few days now since I did the power supply recap, and I'll show you how that turned out in a moment. But uh, before we get into that, I just want to say that... Uh, I'm starting to feel like I stole this one. It was 105 bucks from the Japanese auctions, another 90 bucks to ship it here. And so far I've only got about uh, maybe 220 to 240 bucks total into this thing. That's including all the capacitors I've already done. Well, I guess maybe I should add on the cost of the idler as well, but that's like five, 10 bucks at most, but uh, yeah. This thing's been working really, really well, I have to say. Anyway, I've had it go through the auto calibrate process a couple times now. Well, three or four times actually, and it's been successful every time. You'll have noticed that in my last uh, test of the auto cal on camera, I had it set for chrome tape and it still calibrated a, a normal bias tape. So. Uh, yeah, I've now tried the metal position, and it auto-calibrates that one as well with a Sony Metal SR. So, uh, yeah, I still don't know how good the heads are, but it, they must be decent, at least, if it was able to do that with a metal tape. So, uh, yeah, the first one I tried on it was uh, this uh, JVC G160. I don't really care about this tape. I just wanted to uh, use the... Uh, the JVC tape and the JVC deck just to see what happened and I did a test recording on this 
I did the same uh, vaporwave recording that uh, I used to uh, test this out earlier, which is Cat System Corp's uh, uh, Turns to Gold from the Blue Dream album. And uh, yeah, it had no problems working with this tape, but uh, I should mention in here, you can see it's got suggestions for uh, how far to drive the meters if you've got various tape types. And what I found was this tape couldn't go as far as the marking was. It only goes to about plus two decibels and that's about all you can get out of this without it distorting. However, let me set you back down here. The very next recording I made of it was a full vaporwave tape on one of these uh, Maxell UR60s. As you can see, I got Diskette Parks track point drift on there. This is basically replacing an older recording, which is uh, this one right here. And uh, I always meant to re-record this because this was done on one of the used tapes I got off eBay one of those times. But uh, nothing wrong with this recording. It's just I can't tell what it is just by looking at it easily. Plus, it's uh, used tape, so... Uh, I decided it was time to re-record this, so I had the D99 do a complete new recording on normal bias tape, and I'll be listening to this tonight, so be interesting to see how this turns out. But I'll tell you right now, this thing's got amazing sound quality. I don't think it's at the level it could be, but uh, yeah, I've heard that uh, people compare these in sound to a Nakamichi BX300. And I can kind of see that now, but I don't think it's quite there yet. So, uh, yeah, hopefully the recap will take care of that. But, uh, yeah, as you can see, I've got my alignment instructions all set up here and ready to go because uh, I have a feeling this is going to be done across the finish line by the end of the week at this rate. So, uh, yeah, I'm just going to push through and try to get this done so you're not waiting another week, two weeks, or whatever, to get another high-end deck finished. And then I think once I finish this one, I'll go back in with a Sony 666ES, just because I'm tired of looking at it sitting on the shelf there, mocking me. So, yeah, I want to get that one done. So, it's probably what I'm going to move on to next. And uh, as you can see, I've got some markings here. It's because JVC used uh, decibels for, for values in this thing. And uh, I just figured I'd go in and... Uh, convert these to voltages just so I would have a frame of reference here once I do the electrical adjustments, if I have to do them. Usually when it comes to uh, full recap jobs like this, all I usually have to do is uh, tweak the playback levels and recording levels and that's all they need from there. But uh, this one's auto calibrating, so I'm worried about it breaking the auto cal system. Anyway, before we get back in there, I've got a whole list of the audio chain capacitors laid out here, I hope. And as you can see, there's four down here that are labeled UKZ. That's where I'm going to use the really fancy caps. There's four of them, and only four in this deck that it turns out the UKZ parts are applicable. But uh, these are the... all four of them are in the uh, recording chain directly before the record head. So... Uh, this might turn this deck into a beast. And all these, all four of these capacitors in there right now are currently leaking. They're the uh, dark blue Panasonic garbage caps we got to get rid of. So, uh, yeah, let me get the cover off and I'll show you how the power supply went. Okay, so the power supply. I just did one-to-one -one replacements on all of these. I'm not going crazy and experimenting with this. This deck is too old. I don't want to play with it very much. So yeah, Panasonic FR, anywhere I could find a use for one. Both, all, or not both, I think there are like three 470 microfarad caps. All of, all of those are FR. And I think this one's... 1,000 microfarad, that one's FR, and of course the two main filter caps are FR. So, uh, guts to tell ya, underneath this board is a metal plate with some transistors attached to it. You can just kind of see the one right there where my finger is. 
And uh, that is heat sinked to this plate. So what I ended up doing was I took that whole plate off with all four transistors and I ended up uh, reapplying the thermal grease to it. So uh, the upshot of all this work is this whole area is running much cooler than it used to be. First time I fired up and ran this, it seemed like it was getting fairly hot with almost no activity going at all. And, uh, and now I've done this whole tape and it barely got warm. So uh, that was a good thing to do. A lot of these capacitors were a lot like these ones on this control board here. A lot of them were drifting their way out of spec and just not behaving right anymore. So uh, glad they're gone. So my next step on this deck will probably be mostly off camera. This board is getting recapped. This is the auto calibration computer board. There aren't many electrolytics on this board, but uh, what I really want to do is I want to recap this board separate and see if the auto cal still works on all three tape types. And if it does, then I will continue on to recapping the rest of it. But uh, I got to show you how to deal with a circuit glue first. So I'm going to do that. And I should mention that too. Almost every single board on this deck has had this stuff glued to the back. And uh, yeah, like I said, this, this glue goes uh, conductive and corrosive, so it's best to uh, deal with this. And I've had to deal with it on almost every board in this deck so far. So let me see if I can work this loose. I'll stand that cap up. I'll just gently pry this one up. This one's getting replaced anyway. Which reminds me, I need to uh, do that to the top so I can tell which one it is. Because uh, the reason I'm doing this is because uh, if what I'm doing in the recapping breaks the auto calibration, I want to be able to uh, one by one put the old caps back in and uh, see which one clears up the issue so I can match a new part to, to the old one better. But I don't think I'll have any problems, but uh, you never know. Okay, so as it turns out, I'm not going to be able to get this uh, capacitor off the board unless I deal with the circuit glue first, because uh, I've got the capacitor soldered down to a land that's directly under the circuit glue. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our acetone I'm going to soak a Q-tip in the stuff, and what we're going to do is just uh, hold it right there against the board for a little bit. For a little patch, you want to use maybe a Q-tip or something like that. For a bigger patch, use a cotton ball, maybe. And if it's a cabbage patch, go ahead and make some borscht. That's the only advice I can offer there. Man, I missed my grandma's borscht. Anyway... That may or may not be enough. What we're trying to do is just soften the uh, the circuit glue here. And I'm going to take a dental pick and I'm going to try to uh, scrape it away. I am concerned about this trace that's lifting. Oh, here we go. Now we can access the... Uh, solder pad for that capacitor and when I go back in with new capacitors I will uh, use my Kapton tape and uh, PFTE tubing and, and that'll take care of that let me get some more acetone going here sometimes these the, these patches of old circuit glue are too blackened to respond very well to acetone, so you can use uh, heat as well, but just be careful with that approach, because obviously if you've got a hot air rework station like mine, it's, and you're blasting heat at a board, that could lead to bad things. So anyway, I've got access to that now, so I will continue on with my endeavor here. I'm going to finish recapping this board, like I said. 
I'll test the AutoCal, and then probably tomorrow and Saturday we'll finish up with this deck, I hope. Got that one clean spot there now. <laughs> Fascinating. All right, so it's a couple days later for this segment, and I've got about 90 to maybe 95% of the capacitors in this deck done now. It's going extremely well. I tested it yesterday after I got done most of the audio board capacitors, and it's still auto-calibrating just fine, at least on normal tape. I don't know about uh, metal tape yet, but we'll figure that out in, in due time. Some of these capacitors are not accessible for reasons I'll uh, show you in a minute or five. But uh, yeah, there's four in the playback chain that haven't been done yet, and there's two in the microphone input that haven't been done yet because they're tantalum. Wasn't sure whether or not I was going to actually bother replacing those or not because microphone input, I'm not going to use it. But, uh, yeah, I may go in with the uh, electrolytics there. Not really that good to keep old tantalum capacitors around because they fail shorted, but, uh, yeah, microphone input, I was really on the fence about that. But, uh, there's a lot of gotchas this deck has. There's a few capacitors that aren't really documented or labeled properly. And two of them are C133 and 233. I'll show you where those are later. The deck does have them, but they're not marked. Really hard to find and really hard to figure out what they are. So, uh, yeah, I'll show you that in a minute or five. But uh, first... I'll show you the pile of capacitors I got done yesterday. It took me four hours to do all these things. To my surprise, the obviously leaking Panasonic ones, these dark blue wonders here, which have been puking all over the place for the last God knows how long. To my surprise, most of those dark blue ones are still decent in terms of uh, electrical specifications. No, it's actually these light blue Tosin caps that are drifting out of spec. All of them. So, uh, yeah, if you've got one of these decks, just recap the whole dang thing. That's all I can tell you there. But, uh, as promised, I did listen to Track Point Drift here, the tape this deck recorded with the old capacitors on my, uh, Denon DRM3, which has now been fully recapped on the playback side with audio grade parts, including four UKZ parts. And uh, the DRM3 can hold its own with any other deck I have now for playback. So it's a pretty good judge of uh, character when it comes to uh, this kind of thing. So uh, yeah, I was really, really impressed with the way this sounded. It's fantastic. So, and that was even before I got in there and started changing out the capacitors, but. Uh, I'll show you how things look in there now before I continue. As you can see, I did the, all these capacitors and all this other crap I had cleaned up up here. All that junky brown circuit glue. And there's more on, under the underside of the uh, audio board that you have to clean up too, which I have already done. And you can kind of see what I've got going on in here now. Like back here, you can see a bunch of fine gold parts. Those are all in, mostly in the Dolby circuits, but uh, yeah, I've actually run out of the 3.3 um, microfarad fine gold ones now. You can't get them anymore, and I'm completely out. So uh, I decided to hit up eBay this morning to see what I could find in terms of replacing those with other audio grade parts, and I found an auction that was too tempting to resist, and it's it's one guy in Hong Kong. He had something like 82 Elna Silmic 2s in that value, 63 volts, for 30 bucks. And I couldn't resist, so I bought them. And then still one other guy I found had uh, 10 microfarad parts in UKZ, and I didn't have very many of those. But he was selling a, a batch lot of uh, 92 of those things from England. I bought those too cost me a hundred bucks for those, but uh, I am well stocked on UKZ parts. Speaking of which, the UKZ parts in this deck are right yonder. You can see they're, they're kind of shoehorned in there. 
very little room for these parts. UKZ parts are enormous, and uh, yeah, I just barely got them in there, but uh, these are the four caps directly in the uh, recording chain, directly before the recording head, and uh, as of right now, the deck is still auto-calibrating with these parts, so I think we're going to get away with this, but uh, yeah, I need to finish up the last few remaining parts now, and then also get at these button switches to uh, clean them and both of those require the uh, the whole front of this thing to come off because uh, I'll show you in here there's this giant metal brace here there are a bunch of those capacitors in under there that you can't access unless this audio board comes out and uh, thankfully the service manual tells you how to do that you have to uh, get underneath and just sort of work it backwards that way and then it comes out but yeah, you have to unbolt these uh, switches here first, so uh, let's go ahead and do that. Okay, next step is to free up some wires here. And of course remove this ground connection over here. the screw try and escape oh uh, maybe I'm not gonna get away with uh, completely pulling off the front panel so I guess I disconnected that connector for nothing that's fine I think I can still work with it the way it is it's just not going to be that easy is all. So, let's talk about this uh, underside of the audio board here, because uh, I need to show you where those undocumented caps are. First off, I'm not exactly sure which capacitor that is. I know it's audio grade. It's It doesn't need to be in this location, but... Uh, in this case, this is all I have that I thought was going to fit under here because uh, a lot of my uh, capacitors that I had were uh, a little bit too big for under here. So, yeah, I used that one up there. But the undocumented caps are, Let's see if I can find it, they are up here. This is, uh, let me get my notes. The one on the back side of the board here that I've installed here is, which is a UKT, by the way. Kind of running low on audio grade parts now after this one, but uh, whatever. This one is uh, C133, or no, it's C233. C133 is completely undocumented and is found right here. It is B39. That's actually supposed to be a jumper wire, but in this case, it's a capacitor. And what both of these capacitors do is they couple the Dolby circuits directly into the uh, into the output. So uh, they're very critical capacitors, and uh, they're going to be hard to uh, or easy to miss. So uh, keep those in mind. But uh, yeah, what I have to do right now is I have to uh, zoom out. And I have to unbolt all these uh, screws for the audio board. Because the audio board has to come out now. I love that they're color-coded. Okay, so we're getting ready to uh, remove the front panel. And I'm going to try to do it from this angle because I need to uh, get access to change a bunch of capacitors. But uh, this could go very wrong very quickly, so... Uh, Let's see. I know I will at least have uh, plenty of slack on these wires to get this panel off. And yes, that is the case. And now we need to get access to the uh, screws for the, for the switches, which are back in here. And uh, remember what I said, there's a sliding plate back under here, which blocks the power switch. 
and we're going to have to take all this stuff out now. So uh, keep in mind that this control and this control kind of look alike, but they don't interchange. So uh, yeah, this is all just held in. So I'm going to just remove that, set it aside. And then same deal with the uh, level controls. And by the way, all these have already already been cleaned. At least I think these come off now. Maybe not. I don't know. They should come off, I think. Yeah, they've got to come off. And yeah, this piece is just kind of free-floating back in here. That's why the panel was uh, sort of deformed around the, uh, the display area here. It's because the previous tech wasn't careful enough when he put this back together. And yeah, I'm just going to remove this now. This is the uh, one that's kind of not so good anymore. It's cracking. I don't know if there's anything I can do about that or not, but... I'll put that off to the side as well. I don't know how many of these others can be removed. I just know that these controls are kind of giving me static right now. There we go. I guess they just unclip. So I'll set that off to the side. And now we can see the screws we can we need to get access to to uh, remove the panel. The service manual says there's only two of them, but I don't know. And, uh, oh yeah, I can show you that uh, sliding interlock panel, or that sliding interlock plate, I should say. It's just right up under here. It, it is spring-loaded. So, takes some fiddling to get it to work properly, but uh, you'll get it. Momentary confusion has passed. The two screws we actually want to get access to are this one down here, below this control, and this one up here. For, for the uh, switches, I just worked them loose using a dental pick. And uh, yeah, these are the exact same type of switches that are used in the uh, Sony 666ES. So uh, these, the procedure I use for cleaning these, sw these switches will be exactly the same. So I'll probably do one on camera with you, but uh, yeah, it's not that difficult to do, but whatever. I just got to finish getting this, uh, this board out. Okay, folks, so it's taken me a good 20 minutes to get this board to a point I can actually work on the dang thing, but... Uh, some words of advice for you. If you've got one of these and you're planning on doing the full recap yourself, cut every single wire tie that's in there. Up in behind the, uh, or below the uh, auto cal board. It's all going to try and hang you up. And uh, to make things further easier for myself, what I had to do was uh, I had to desolder these two wire wrap posts and also there's one over here number seven and yeah there's not enough slack on those wires in order to get the board to this point otherwise so uh i just decided to go ahead and desolder those and pull them out and not bother with the wire wrap at all so uh yeah i should be able to get in here and replace the rest of the capacitors now and also uh get at these uh switches here to clean them but uh it wasn't fun getting to this point, I'll tell you what. So, uh, I've got my work cut out for me, so I'm going to go off camera now, finish up the recap, and then maybe we'll pick up with the uh, switches, or at least one switch, I don't know. We'll have to figure out what I'm doing yet. I'm at least going to uh, have to uh, disassemble the three tape-type switches because they are flaky in this model. The deck is supposed to remember its AutoCal settings as long as it's turned on for all three tape types, but uh, I've noticed that, uh, yeah, sometimes it, it doesn't because of the way these switches are. But, uh, yeah, that's neither here nor there. i got to finish this recap. All right, so the last of the caps are done. There's one I'm not sure about, and it's this one right here. 
It's the same value as this little guy, but uh, unfortunately I'm completely out of anything that's smaller than this, so uh, I had to go with the big one up here. This is a 50 volt cap. I don't know if this is going to work because of clearance, but it's the only thing I have, so I'll try and make it work. It should fit. I don't know. We've got some wiggle room here. It goes right about where the screw is here, if you can see that. So, yeah, we'll just have to try it and see if it works. But uh, everything else is done. I decided to make an executive decision and do these in... Uh, in uh, audio grade parts as well. These are UFW parts from Nichicon, and they're C207 and C107. So uh, hopefully they work out. But uh, yeah, all the capacitors are done now, and I have to uh, try and get this switch panel off now. That's going to be fun. My uh, solder pulled is going to be busy on this one. So uh, let me get to that, and we'll pick up again when I got that out. All right, so I got this whole switch assembly out. It was not easy, and we are going to uh, try to uh, do some work on this. This has this little sliding latch plate or sliding latch thingy that uh, that the triple uh, six ES had. So beware of that. But uh, basically, the same type of uh, deal here. Just got to pop this switch apart and then we can clean it up real good and put her back in. Just releasing the clip and spring first. We'll do the longest one first on camera. I believe this is the chrome switch. Hopefully these parts don't go flying. Desoldering these things was not fun, but uh, I did get them out. So we're going to do this. These three up here, I will probably just, well, maybe I won't shoot them, shoot contact cleaner in them like I did for the uh, monitor switch, but we'll see. Anyhow, that should be loose now. I don't think there's a latching pin in that one, but I could be wrong. Oh, and we busted a little set of fingers here. I might have to glue this back together once I'm done. That's fine. We have access to this now. Just lift it off like so, and we've got eight sets of little contacts in there. Wonderful. And some of them are fairly severely oxidized, so, uh... Be very gentle with these little tiny contacts, because, uh... They are quite fragile. And yeah, I don't know if you can see very well, but uh, that's how bad this switch is. I'm on the fence about this, but I think I'm going to go ahead and polish this.
So I'm going to get out the auto saw, fresh Q-tip. So it's basically the same thing I did with the triple six ES. And this switch should be clean now. Well, except there's polish on it, but uh, that's easy enough to clean up. Okay, we'll clean this up and put it back together. Well, I gotta clean the other side of the contacts too. That's no problem though. Oh, that is looking good now. One more pass with the isopropyl alcohol. Okay, that side of it is about ready to go back together then. I'll put some deoxid D100 in there as well to a uh, lube and stuff, but we gotta service these little contacts. Give me one second here. And the way I will service these contacts is the same way I did it for the uh, Sony. I'm cutting out a piece of uh, copy paper right now. I'm just gonna fold it lengthwise, like so. I'm gonna grab my acetone, if I can find it, dip the paper in the acetone, and I'm going to just Grab these little contacts and one by one, just run them over the acetone. Not a lot coming off of these things, so. There is a little bit, you can see a little bit of a line on that paper, but uh, not too bad. All right, so I've cleaned everything off camera. I'm going to do a test reassembly of the uh, switch housing just to see if this will snap closed. I didn't realize these didn't come apart the same way as the triple six ES switches do. Yeah, this is going to be interesting to put back together. I think they'll go back together but, uh, yeah, clearly these pins are sort of a, sort of a, you know, kind of heat-shaped to uh, not come apart easy. So, uh, yeah, I think what I'll do is if, is once I get these, this switch back together, like so, I'll snap it closed with some pliers and, uh, Maybe put some uh, super glue on the back to hold them back together. That's the only way I can see to do this, because uh, this needed to come apart for cleaning. Very obviously. So let me see if I can get this back together and, uh, yeah. Okay, that's one switch done. The big long one is back together and hopefully working properly. I don't think it's going to have any problems, but we'll see. I did super glue the back here, so should hold itself together. But uh, yeah, got to do this one and this one and maybe this one and I'll be done. These three here, I'm just going to squirt contact cleaner inside and hope they work because these are the Dolby switches and I don't use Dolby anyway. So let me get this done, and uh, probably the next shot you see will be the uh, deck back together. We'll see. All right, the deck is back together, and hopefully everything works. I have my doubts, but uh, I always have my doubts when it comes to something this invasive. But uh, 
I'll show you that one capacitor I was worried about. It's kind of peeking out right there. Turns out there's more than enough space for it, so hopefully she's going to work. Shall we see if we can get the magic smoke to come out? Powered right up. I've got the uh, test bench receiver turned on right now, the Sony ES receiver. Okay, quartz lock is lit up. By the way, that's a lamp in there. That's a 9-volt lamp if you need to replace it. Decided not to recap the meter board because uh, it's full of bipolar caps and I'm not sure if I've even got them, so I can always do that another time if I need to. Those are the, that's the only board left with the original capacitors, so see if we get some audio. Sure sounds like it does audio. Not sure if the EQ is right yet, but... Uh, We'll determine that as time goes by. This monitor so s source switch, that was really bad when I got that one apart. I mean, there was green corrosion around the uh, contacts in that one, so I'm real happy that it went back together properly. That one was a bear to deal with, but uh, deal with it, I did. So we're going to see if the AutoCal works on this tape. It's the uh, JVC normal bias tape. I'll try the other tapes maybe tomorrow or something because it's getting late in the day now and uh, I still have yet to do the calibration on this so uh, let's see what happens here. It may take a bit because not calibrated yet. That'll be a success. So, uh, yeah, I'm not sure about doing the calibration on camera anymore, but uh, I'll do that tomorrow. I'll figure out whether or not I'm going to subject you to that or not. At least we might do the uh, Dolby level together because I've got a new way of doing that I want to try. And maybe it's best if I do that on camera with you guys. But, uh, yeah... Every capacitor in the audio board is done. Every capacitor in the computer board is done. Power supply, control board, motor board. Yeah, this is the only board left that doesn't have new capacitors. So I'm kind of happy with the way this has gone together. So uh, I'll pick this back up tomorrow. Okay, folks, we are in the home stretch with this thing, and I'm about to align the playback levels on camera with y'all. Before we do that, I should probably go through a few of these things here. I don't know if there's much to go through. I've already found a mistake in these destructions here, so uh, you got to sort of have your thinking cap on when you go through these adjustments because sometimes uh, the people who make these manuals make mistakes and, uh, well, I caught one. Right up here in the uh, decode calibration for the uh, Dolby C playback, They've got VRA1 and VRB02. Those are the wrong adjustments. VRA01 is correct, but this one should be VRA02. So yeah, watch for that. But uh, again, as you can see, I've made uh, conversions over to uh, volts for all of these. But uh, I just wanted to mention for playback level, which we are going to be doing on camera... JVC wants you to do that using a special test tape that's done at 1 kilohertz, and uh, they want to, you to adjust VR101 and, one, and 201 until the lineup becomes about negative 4 decibels, and I've got a better way of doing that than uh, JVC has it here. And I want to talk about that real quick, because uh, I've never used this method before, and uh, yeah... So, the best way to do this, I am told, is to use this here HPR Dolby tape. And uh, 
And in order to get the adjustment readings, you have to get these uh, readings from the Dolby chip itself. So, a couple of kind people at uh, Tape Heads have come up with a way to, uh, or with a chart to do this properly. I'll show it to you right here. I've got it printed out. Thanks to a uh, knack newbie at uh, Tape Heads for making this chart for us and uh, forum member Lucky for coming up with these values. We now know exactly what to calibrate this deck to using the Dolby chip. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, he's got uh, three different tape types up here. There's the ANT Audio L04 tape up here. There's the HPR 200 tape. Well, that's the one I've got, so we're going to be using that value. Then there's a newer HPR tape that, at 250. And uh, there's uh, readings for that value for that tape as well, but I don't have that tape, so I'm using column number two. <clears throat> Excuse me, I can't clear my throat today. Anyway, the chip this deck uses, well, actually, there's more than one. There's four of them, is the NE650. So we get the measurement at pin three, and we look for 549 millivolts here. And uh, JVC, being awesome as they are in this deck, has provided us with actual test points at those pins. You can see I've got the uh, scope hooked up to them right now. And the adjustments for these are right there and right up there. So this is going to be easy, I think. So let's get started. I've got the scope up and running. We're going to use the measurement function of the scope in order to uh, dial this in. See if I can uh, actually get you in on the scope here. Well, maybe it's best if I zoom out so you can see me adjusting in real time. That should do the job. Okay, I'm going to power up. I am on the tape position, and uh, where's my adjustment thing I just had? Okay, NE650, 549 millivolts. That's what we're looking for. So uh, I'm going to do both channels at the same time. So let's go ahead and do this. Uh, uh, horizontal. Let's get the whole thing in here. And let's go up in vertical scale, like so. There we go. And we are getting, what, 1.6 volts? That can't be right. How is that so high? Why is that so high? Capacitor changes alone can't account for that. All right, folks, I think I figured out what's going on here. Problem is, I didn't remember enough of my basic electronics theory from back when I was a teenager. Basically, what we have to do is we have to convert the RMS voltage value from this, which is 549 millivolts, and we have to convert that to the peak-to-peak -peak value to expect in the scope. And when I do that calculation, I get 1.552 volts. So the deck was pretty close, and I've got it pretty much dialed in now, but I'll just show you here. I can't get it looking much better than this. The controls are really twitchy on this, but uh, I'm happy. But anyway, we got this dialed in now, and uh, fixing to get the record and play test done for you so you can hear how it sounds. As for where this deck goes in the top five, not sure if it gets into the top five, but uh, gotta keep in mind that uh, the recording quality may be far better than the playback quality because of the uh, UKZ parts in the recording chain. So uh, we'll see how that works out. One thing I should mention is I'm finding that these uh, Sony Metal SR tapes, a lot of these decks can't really peek them out very well, that particular tape. 
I'm not sure if any of them can actually. The uh, TDV 931 could only go up to about plus eight decibels. It couldn't get all the way up to the suggested level mark on that deck. And uh, I've just been finding that with the uh, Sony Metal SRs. So I'm thinking about getting better metal tapes for this kind of thing. But uh, for now, the Metal SRs are what I have, so we're going to use them. Anyway, yeah, pays to remember your electronics theory. Probably would have thought about that myself if it weren't for uh, me learning this stuff when I did, followed by 18 years of welfare, basically. Hard to keep stuff in mind when you're struggling to find food and stuff. So, yeah, I got it straightened out in my head now. So, uh, this deck is fully aligned. So, uh, yeah, not left to do now, but find out how it sounds. So, uh, let's go do that, shall we? Down. 